The Rebel Capitalist Show. So, uh, Peter, if you could maybe start off by telling us what has been your experience with censorship over the last two years. I can address uh, the issue within the uh, scientific world of peer-reviewed publications. So this is very important. You know, we rely on submission of scientific manuscripts, whether it's original data, uh, an ed a review paper which summarizes the work of others, or uh, opinion, or uh, what's called editorial. Uh, papers. And in the uh, fields of the biological sciences, they are, in a sense, once they're fully vetted and peer reviewed, they're memorialized in the National Library of Medicine. You can search them under PubMed. You can go back 100 years or more. And so whatever is published in PubMed, in a sense, becomes a permanent installation. And uh, we, in the last few years, we, a very disturbing trend occurred in the peer reviewed literature, which always presents an array of different points. I can tell you on any form of therapy, there'll be papers that uh, strongly support the therapy and other papers that think that therapy is too dangerous or, or has uh, shortcomings to it. And there's always a give and take in the medical literature. Same thing with a surgery. There'll be proponents of a surgery and those people will say, oh, the surgery doesn't work. And so there's always this balance in the field of medicine and doctors, patients and others have really become used to this, that in fact, there's always in many ways uh, to handle a particular circumstance. In the last two years, for the first time, we started to see a unilaterality develop, a directionality develop where two sides of an issue weren't uh, presented equally. And then we saw some underhanded things. In fact, uh, uh, falsified manuscripts fully accepted and published in some of the best medical journals, most widely cited medical journals, both in the UK and America. And it turned out these were falsified. Uh, they were turned out to be completely fraudulent, actually anchored by uh, the top medical institution in the United States, but they were actually fraudulent and withdrawn from these journals after about two weeks of exposure, which threw the, uh, the community into great confusion. And then after that, we've seen just now a steady progression of bias towards only one approach in this critical phase of the world's crisis. And the bias now is relentless. Right. It is absolutely relentless. And, and only papers that are supportive of that approach move forward. Others that are dissenting views don't see the light of day in these journals. So it's narrative driven instead of science driven or, or there appears to be uh, now inculcated in every editorial office in the country now this bias now i'm formerly editor of two major journals two major journals right. you know long standing editor of journals and i know how journals work at editorial offices and deputy editor editorial boards associate editors and in both journals over the last year i have been dismissed as the editor with no courtesy phone call, no editorial board vote, no discussion among the deputy editor or the associate editors. In fact, I've just received essentially like a certified letter or email with no explanation. Right, and this has happened to several people that have dissenting views. I, yeah, I've, I've, I'm publishing broadly across the range of issues, uh, broadly. And so it can't be any particular issue, in my view, the disturbing thing is the lack of due process. Listen, a journal is entitled to change editors. Many times there is a plan after so many years as a change of an editor. But, you know, no courtesy phone call, no uh, board vote, no due process, actually no handoff. It didn't give me a chance to even hand off the editorial duties to the next editor. How does the scientific process typically work? So let, let's rewind back to 2015, or I mean, you've been in this area for quite some time. How is it supposed to work, and, and why is that? Why has that served us well for so long? Well, I can tell you the traditional approach. Let's say for an original data manuscript, is that uh, the authors, once they finalize their manuscript, there's submission portals to the major journals. So they would submit the uh, manuscript and the associated files supplementary materials. The typical 
high level original data manuscript, by the way, is, is typically about the same amount of effort as a PhD thesis. I mean, it's a big deal. Mm. And uh, the paper is uploaded. Uh, it, it comes to uh, the editor, or one of the associate editors, and there's a preliminary review saying, is this going to even be viable in our journal? If the answer is yes, then it goes out to peer review. So it'll go out anywhere from two to six reviewers who review the paper, and then they will have criticisms or edits. And they're just trying they to poke holes in it. That's their well, main objective. Or, or how to improve it, or there may be yeah. threats to validity. But then after all this comes in, there is a decision. The decision may be to reject it. And many journals have like 90% rejection rates. So I can tell you that this is common. Yeah. Uh, but in that 10% where they're accepted, they're almost always accepted with acceptable changes that they must be changed in order to uh, you know, address certain criticisms. So I am telling you for each and every manuscript, it's a very high bar. I know this, I have about 670 of these in the peer-reviewed literature. I'm the most published person in my field, the interface between heart and kidney disease than anybody in history. So I'm very familiar with this process. And I, I, it is arduous, it is rigorous, but I can tell you it's fair. It was fair up until the last several years. But uh, my, my main point there is the efficacy or, or the efficiency of this, this process in general. John, let's go over to you because you are co-authors on this book uh, with Peter, and your background is really in history. So what I'd like you to uh, describe or uh, tell my audience is how does what we're seeing right now with this push towards censorship compare with what we have seen throughout history? Like when you look at what we're dealing with right now, what does this remind you of? I mean, does it remind you of a Stalin? Does it remind you of 1930s Germany? Or am I just, or is that uh, being hyperbolic? No, it's, it's not being hyper, hyperbolic at all. But what it reminds me of is most of human history. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I think, you know, you start with the study of anthropology. And you see that, that humans, we, I think we tend to have a seeking of authoritative explanations of the world. And, you know, going way back before the so-called scientific revolution of the 17th, 16th and 17th centuries, humans tended to have metaphysical and cosmological explanations of things. Um, I think in every society, something akin to a priesthood was very important. Um, priesthoods could have immense power. I mean, you're down you have a connection with South America. We know, for example, the Aztec priesthood was immensely powerful. Mm -hmm. And they also were in possession of, of astronomy and mathematics. They could predict the movements of stars and planets with remarkable precision, or way ahead of the Spaniards when they showed up. So you see um, an inclination towards something like orthodoxy. And when we have moments of instability in the world, I think a very notable one um, is around the time of Martin Luther, when he began to protest what he saw as corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. You have this tremendous anxiety that sweeps across Europe. Established power structures were destabilized. So the um, Roman Catholic Church founded this institution. It was actually before the, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. It went back even before then, but it really takes on an immense power during the Reformation, the Holy Office of the Inquisition. And this is a way of trying to preserve an orthodoxy of sentiment and, and, um, and knowledge of the world. The guy who we know really got into the most notable trouble from the scientific realm with the Holy Office was Galileo. I mean, a lot of guys got into trouble with the Holy Office, but Galileo is really one of the most notable in history. Um, the guy was a great observational scientist and mathematician. He runs afoul of the Holy Office, and he spends the last 11 years of his life under house arrest. For, for quote-unquote, misinformation. For misinformation, for his Copernican uh, view of, of, of the universe or of the galaxy. Um, and um, so he, he was a notable guy in many respects as a sort of um, 
I don't know, you know, archetypal character of a guy who, who is observing the natural world and is actually telling the truth of the natural world, but the authorities um, consider what he's saying to be threatening in some way to establish um, orthodoxy, orthodox way of viewing the universe. Mm -hmm. So what I think there's a fascinating moment in history where John Milton uh, is a young writer and, and um, I, I guess he had some aspirations to public office. He actually visited Galileo in, under house arrest. And as an English speaking uh, writer, I'm, I, I've, I've always been interested in the character of, of Milton. In 1644, he gave a speech before parliament. It was this fiery defense of free speech. Mm. And so, you know, this, this, this conflict between orthodoxy and free speech I mean, it really goes, you know, at least as far back as the 17th century, Milton really giving a spirited defense of it. By the time we get to our founding fathers, you know, Alexander, excuse me, um, James Madison, I mean, he had a very clear view of this. I, I will try and sum up, I think, what our founding fathers considered to yeah, be. Yeah, that was my next question. I mean, I, what they realized is that <clears throat> there's always a competition in society about who's right and who's wrong about vitally important things affecting the health of the body politic and, and, and in the case of medicine, the, the health of, of, of human, the physical health of human beings. But what Madison in particular concluded, and he was a great historian and a great student of literature going back to the Romans and Greeks, you know, our founding fathers were remarkably educated. These were these were guys that grew up in libraries. They learned Latin and Greek. Apparently, Jefferson could write Latin and Greek simultaneously. I mean, these were very, very gifted people who studied history. And what they concluded was it's best to let humans converse, talk, share notes. You're going to get rabble rousers and fanatics who are proposing things that are erroneous, that could lead people astray. Um, um, but the, the deleterious consequences of trying to establish an orthodoxy, and this is the reality of the world, and that's it, and there's going to be no further discussion. They considered the, the outcome of that to be far, far more dangerous to society and, and to, to liberty and to progress in everything, trade, science, medicine, Everything advances through the free exchange of ideas and opinions and observations. So when I graduated in 1996 from grad school with my master's degree in political philosophy, I, I really naively just thought this is a settled thing, at least in the United States. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just, it never would have occurred to me in a thousand years if I could live so long that we would suddenly have not only censorship, but widespread censorship. And then it culminates in our, in our strange little drama over the last two years in censoring a man of just absolutely pure scholarship, um, such as Peter. I mean, I and just- multiple I interviewed people him in on, his position. And, and, Multi we could list, you know, I don't want to do it for the YouTube here, but we could list- four or five people that would fit into that category as well. It's just, anyway, I've, I've pontificated as I do. Um, you know, so it's the Holy Office of the Inquisition. It's it's the, the Soviet NKVD and, and KGB and the Cheka. It's the Gestapo. It's, it's Goebbels, um, yeah. you know, Ministry of Enlightenment. I mean, it's George Orwell's 1984. I mean, somebody told me the other day, have you heard about this kind of wacky development that's happening in Washington? They're talking about, it's something like a, a ministry of truth. And I, I said, no, 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 that's from George Orwell's 1984. I mean, so that can't be. And he said, no, 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 it really is like some, some kind of like federal ministry for maintaining orthodoxy. Like there can only be a and I just thought, okay, now we've, you know, this is Rod Serling, you know, John Leake has entered the twilight zone. <laughs>